my name is Rodrigo Pablos Bravo. I'm a PhD student at uh, Complutense University of Madrid, and I am doing my thesis about uh, bell beaker decoration in Cien Pozuelos style in, in all the Iberial Peninsula. I want to apologize because I will read my speech because I want to uh, do it on time and uh, saying the, the whole things that I want to say. First, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for inviting us, inviting us to come. For us who are just starting out in our scientific career, it's a real honor to be here among the best. <laughs> thank you. Whenever a technological tool is used, especially if it's on the rise, the first thing to do is to identify the problem to be solved with it and to establish a hypothesis that can be verified with the method. In the case of Bell Beaker pottery, there are several problems that can be analyzed with deep learning algorithms and computer vision. In this first approach, we have chosen two of them, different in complexity and scope. The first one is more technical to identify whether the decoration was made by incision or impression. Traditionally, the late Bill Baker styles, especially in Southern Europe and Africa, have been called incised or incised impressed styles. But some authors have noted that it's the impressed technique what seems to characterize all of them, such as Tiempozuelos or Palmela. However, later ceramic groups from the Bronze Age, which share decorative motifs with Bell Beaker, were made with an incised technique. This fact, which a priori doesn't seem to have any social consequences, would be really interesting if we could demonstrate that all the late Bell Beaker styles are entirely made with impressed technique, while the later incised pottery would be def different from the bell beaker phenomenon. Thus, the decorative syntax of some later bell beaker styles that some, some authors have noted wouldn't be the only thing with symbolic importance, but also the technique used could be meaningful. The second problem that we focus on in this work is the ability to identify the hands of the artisans who develop the decoration. If it's possible to identify how different artisans have worked on the decorations and to assign different parts of the work to each of them, a new and very promising perspective opens up. The possibility of carrying out studies at the level of the individual something very difficult to achieve in the study of prehistory. In order to solve the problems and verify the initial hypothesis, we propose a project that combines experimental archaeology, deep learning and computer vision techniques, which have given good results in other areas of archaeological research. We proposed a sample with four groups of variables with 18 slabs each which yielded a total sample of 72 slabs. The characteristics of each group were defined by the technique used in their creation and the artisans who made them. For the creation of the sample, we relied on part of the extensive bibliography about experimental and ethnographic pottery making. The slabs were made with mica-based clay that shines very brightly with the incidence of light. This, this type of clay is very common in inner Iberia. The tools used for incising and impressing were made by hand on wooden blades to imitate as closely as possible those available in prehistoric times, occasionally, docu occasionally documented. Both artisans made the slabs with the same tools. This makes that the model doesn't learn from the differences between tools, but from the technical characteristics left by the artisans. This was planned in this way to better test the real potential 
of the method at differentiating highly similar marks. The firing of the clay slabs was carried out in a pit kiln, widely documented in traditional communities, communities, for example, in North Africa, and extensively studied in prehistoric, in prehistoric period. The 72 slabs were placed inside the pit in levels intercalated by sawdust. On top of it, we placed a large fire with oak wood in order to reach the necessary temperature to firing for the firing of the clay between 500 and 900 degrees. This type of kiln generates ceramic with irregular firings, very typical of the late prehistoric period. This fact improves the variability of the sample and brings it even closer to the real archeological material. Images were taken with a binocular loop at 20x magnification. Several pictures are taken of the same sample, collecting all possible focuses in order to, by stacking the images, obtain a completely focused sample. For this first approach to the method, we have generated a sample of about 200 pictures per group, making a total of just over 800 pictures. Gabriel? Okay, uh, may I be able to share my screen or we can do it like shouting to my partner? I think I will pass the slides. <laughs> okay, so in that case, I'm going to continue like this. Uh, image recognition using artificial intelligence or AI algorithms has experimented an exponential growth in the use in recent times. Nowadays, it is more and more common to see automated systems using AI to perform specific tasks, such as car plate identification, autonomous driving vehicles, image generation, or even medical research and disease uh, detection. Artificial intelligence also made a shy entrance into archaeological research, but nowhere near as the use that, that this new tool has been given by any other scientific disciplines. However, the scarce number of archaeological papers that have addressed AI as a tool have shown good results that should act as an, as an incentive to adopt this new tool into archaeological research. Uh, pass the... <laughs> okay. uh, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which in itself is another subfield located within the broader field of artificial intelligence. Deep learning is characterized by the concept of end-to-end -end learning, unlike machine learning algorithms, Deep learning does not require variables to be selected and extracted by the analyst. This, this means that unprocessed data can be passed directly to the algorithm, and said algorithm will be in charge of identifying and extracting the necessary data to get an output classification. This method of training is especially useful for problems where it is difficult to define and accurately describe the variables involved, as this is the case for the experiments that we have in hand. Pasalo. Uh, in our experiments, we didn't know beforehand which variables and features will be distinctive to separate decorative techniques and artist agency. And thus, describing and quantifying them will, be, have, will have been a really uh, complex affair. Awesome. Computer vision algorithms are trained on any given set of images by splitting the sample, the main sample, into two groups. That is the training set and the testing set. The training set has, is formed by the images plus the ID labels that are able to identify uh, to which group the image belongs. The testing sample is composed by the image without the labels for the model to test if it has learned properly to classify the problem. Asa. The algorithm tries to extract important features of the training set and it uses the labels to associate those features with a specific class or group. Then it tests its classification power against the test group and corrects the weights of its decisions depending on the output classification and if it was correct or not. In the end, algorithms are trained using trial, error, and repetition until the algorithm is capable of accurately extracting the necessary variables to make a correct classification. This is the concept that we saw earlier from end-to-end -end learning. Pasa. To try to answer our two research questions, we used state-of-the-art computer vision models that excel at image classification. 
To overcome the pitfalls of our relatively small sample, we use transfer learning models to get the benefits of already trained models when it comes to feature detection and image processing. These models are shown in this slide, and these are EfficientNet, ResNet, DenseNet, and VGG19. We won't be going through the inner architecture of these models in this presentation, but further information is located in their original papers. Awesome. After some preliminary tests, we decided to, train the, to trim the images just to the marks themselves and to turn them to grayscales to avoid that the difference of clay due to firing could be used as a significant variable by the algorithm. Dale. The, rest, the results of these models were as follow with ResNet. Uh, ah no, dale un pelín, dale para atrás, perdona. The results of this model were as follows, uh, with ResNet being the one scoring a higher accuracy with a better loss value. Furthermore, no overfitting was observed and the model was sufficiently stable to be able to generalize, as we are seeing in these graphs. The results show that both decorative techniques can be differentiated with a high degree uh, of confidence just using the, just the marks themselves. Awesome. Um, the second question was going to be a little more difficult to answer. We divided our grayscale dataset into four groups according to decorative techniques and artists. ResNet came on top again with the other models underperforming specifically, especially for the case of EfficientNet, which is a convolutional neural network uh, specifically trained to be trained on larger datasets uh, and sample sizes. However, these models were unstable on their learning, as we can see in these graphs. So a bit more of fine tuning was needed. Awesome. To fine tune the hyperparameters of these models, we chose ResNet as it had been the best scoring one of the previous tests. Fine tuning the learning rate and the optimizers of the models, and also increasing its learning time, we managed to get a more stable model with 82% accuracy for the case of the a specific um, uh, optimizer. <clears throat> in fact, training ResNet with these hyperparameters uh, yielded an interclass specification accuracy PASA, of 100% for the impression marks generated by the first artist, which is pretty remarkable. <clears throat> Finally, we run a GradCam algorithm on some of the images to understand the model's decisions. GradCam highlights the areas of the image that are being used by the model to classify the image. These images inform us that the model was looking mainly at the inner groove to make a classification, but also at the shoulder of the marks, which turns, which turns out to be really informative regarding the decorative technique used, that is impression versus incision. As a final remark, we can see for the impression samples that the algorithm was using the shoulder probably to separate incision from impression. And it was also using the walls of the group which could be related to different depths of the marks, depending on the pressure exerted by the two different artists, and therefore uh, giving and yielding this classification. Especially informative for that is the sample that we have on the top right, where we can see that only the walls and the shoulder are highlighted. Asa. So on the one hand, these results open a very promising path to new approaches and proposals with real archaeological material. The high accuracy in the identification of the decorative technique may allow, in this sense, to solve the problems of, observed in the bibliography of the label beaker studies. On the other hand, this preliminary study has made it clear that models based on computer vision are able to clearly identify differences between decorations made by different artisans, even if they were made with the same tools. Furthermore, the application of the method on real archaeological material can bring a real revolution in the interpretation of the Bill Beaker phenomenon. Thus, from a theoretical point of view, creating a large sample of Bill Beaker decorations from a closed deposit, such as a grave, could allow us to discover with a high degree of accuracy if all the vessels were made by the same artisans, artisan of if several were involved in the manufacture. Finally, after analyzing these surprising and promising results, we have the possibility of improving the method, the method increasing the sample, and considering the development of new algorithms 
to improve the models and their accuracy. In addition, the use of 3D models of the samples may allow to elaborate more comprehensive and deeper analysis and to solve even more complex problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Have any questions? Yes, we do. Uh, a lot. <laughs> I know. Gabriel? Hello, yeah. Questions. Okay, I'm ready. Huh. I'm Astaguchi from Hungary. Did, did I understand correctly that the two artisans use the, exactly the same one piece of tool? The same, exactly this one. <laughs> So it was only one, two, and yes. two, two artisans used them. The two artisans used the same, these two tools. With this uh, thing, we eliminate the possibility that the algorithm is uh, seeing the different tools. They, yes. The, the algorithm, I, but yes, Gabri. I would like to add that uh, these two tools that we were using, in fact, the one on the left is the one we use from the impression uh, sample. While the one on the right is the one we use for incision. And in fact, yeah, we use uh, both of these tools to try to reduce variability and try to test the potential of the algorithm to make this kind of classification and differentiation. Since theoretically, if we were using the same tool, the differences in the marks themselves and the groups will not be associated with the tool, but just by the decorative technique and also by the artisans themselves. Which is not uh, real because each artisan should have uh, their own tools, so. Thank you. Uh, I have exactly the same question, but you answer a little, but so you, you have, the, you postulate that uh, during the Bell Beaker uh, period, so the crafts, Bell Beaker, the Bell Beaker crafts people, use the same tool no no so no <laughs> so so how could you with your method identify different crafts people artisans artisan? theoretically uh, with when two artisans of craftsmen use uh, different tools the identification is easier because the, the, um, the mark left by, by those tools are different. But we didn't want to see if the uh, model could differentiate the, the tools. We wanted to know if the, the model can, can uh, put in the correct group two marks made with the same tool, but by different artisans. Yeah, I, I, will, I will, sorry. I will like to add something. In a okay. Moment. In a moment, in a moment, you can continue. I mean, with these results, uh, which are the more difficult mm, tests that we can make exp with experimental uh, archeology, span uh, theor theoretically, uh, if you, if we use this method, in archaeological material, real archaeological material, should be easier because two artisans uh, use two different tools, at, at least theoretically. No. Nope. Uh, okay. So you want I wanted to ask something, if possible. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's a game I want to make clear that our main objective during this test was not to produce an, a readily usable model to be applied for the archaeological record. This was just a brief preliminary study that we aim to test if these models, these artificial intelligence models, were in fact capable of doing this kind of differentiation. Because of this, uh, we tried to make the, the resolution of this test as hard as possible to try to push it to its limits. But in fact, um, what we are aiming to do next is expand the reference collections, include maybe a different set of tools also. So we can, in the end, um, make this kind of models really available to use for archeological material. 
And furthermore, we also have to stress that, uh, again, this is only a preliminary study, but uh, what we wanted to highlight and pinpoint in this presentation was the fact that uh, this machine is capable of differentiating between marks that were made by the same tools using the same techniques and only differing in the artists who made them. So here we bring up to the table the possibility, at least theoretically, that uh, just the alcoholical material contains the necessary traces and the necessary features to be differentiated and made this kind of uh, classifications and the group distinctions. Therefore, in the future, we should develop new algorithms that aim to do the same at the archaeological record. But now we are bringing to the table the possibility and the confirmation that this is possible just by looking at the archaeological material. Thank you very much. I think maybe I could add uh, an element to this. Um, it is possible to imagine a workshop where people share tools. So in this case, this identification of the hand of the artisans with the similar tool is useful, even though it's only theoretical. Yeah, and uh, I look forward to hear more about your research once you are on archaeological material, because I have many questions for you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, oh, oh, yeah, we have a last we? question maybe before lunch. Okay. Um, do, you take it, do you take into, into consideration that the tool uh, may show some abrasions uh, by using uh, it a long time? Uh, so maybe the first uh, worker has a fresh tool and the second worker has an, yes. We did it yeah. and we uh, made turns. Yeah. First, the first slab, I did the first, uh, he did the second, I did the third. So okay. you can... Yes. Oh, one yeah, more so question. Basically, we try to make a random distribution in the using of the tool. The last question. Yeah. Wait, uh, Gabriel. Wait. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, I, I have. Well, I have a question. So you demonstrate that there are differences between two different person with the same tool, and my question is: Do you think that? If this is the same person with the same tool, we can observe some different uh, traces. Uh, the method can put together all my marks. When it learns, it it's it learns uh, all the images. He can put my marks in. Uh, here with 100% of accuracy just my marks in, in uh, his marks was a little lower the accuracy so if um, if I do the whole collection just me if I do the collection probably he would know it would know know it so it sees differences between the marks that i made and gabriel and the gabriel's one okay i would also like to add that uh, obviously this is going to all depend on the differences that there are between these people making the marks Let's say that, for example, you are making the reference collections with the same tool and you are just one person, but suddenly you start marking the marks deeper for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it, that is all the data sample and all the data set uh, the algorithm has, it's going to try to make a differentiation and probably it's going to find something. But this is going to be reflective of different uh, types of making these marks, that is applying different pressures and, for example, uh, making the incision or the impression with a different angle on the ceramics. So it's probably going to reflect that. But also we have to take into account that when these final algorithms are going to be trained, they are not going only to be trained in just 800 images. They are going to be trained on a far more variable and widespread and comprehensive data set that is going to contain a lot more variability and variables to take into account. And therefore, probably the variability between just uh, one person doing the mark with the same tool is not going to be enough to be able to differentiate it 
because all is going to make more emphasis on differentiating maybe different tools and also maybe different decorative uh, techniques more than just uh, different specifics related to uh, one person working with the same tool. I know that this seems to be magic or something uh, difficult, uh, but this is just about the 10% of the sample that we want to, to make. We have a lot of slabs and this is something, the first approach that we made for this uh, workshop and probably we uh, will improve these these results in the next months probably so thank you very much i guess okay. thank you <laughs>